Welcome to Total MD. In today's video, we are going to continue on with the rest of the scheduler options and move forward with our patient into their ledger. I'm going to begin by going to my patient list, selecting Mr. George Clooney, and then going to the options menu and selecting edit patient or by double clicking his name. From our last video, you'll recall that we went ahead and put in some medical alerts for the patient. So every time you access the patient's data or file in any way, you will get an alert pop-up that gives you those medical alert details. We'll go ahead and click OK to get past that, and it'll open up George Clooney's file. We left off last time on the Insurance Information tab, where we had attached Blue Cross Blue Shield to George Clooney after creating that plan. And I'm going to go ahead and say that George carries his own plan, so he is the subscriber of the insurance. And I'm going to go ahead and put in his copay amount. We'll say he has a $25 copay for each visit, and we'll put in his policy ID number. If we have a group number for George's plan, we can go ahead and enter it here as well. I am going to select assignment of benefits, so I make sure that the office receives the payment in this situation for George's office visit instead of the patient receiving the payment. So it's very important that you do pay attention to this box. If the office is supposed to receive the payment, make sure this box is checked. And I do have my deductible information laid out here when the plan renews. We're going to go ahead and say George does not have any secondary or tertiary insurance at this time and save our changes. I'm going to close out my patient list because I don't need it any longer and jump to the scheduler. We do have George here on the schedule for today and you can see by this yellow dot that he is checked in to the office. And if I hover over the appointment, we do get the pop-up that gives us all of the details about his appointment that we laid out in the setup screen. So we've got his phone number, his patient balance, which is zero because he's a new patient, his copay amount, the date his appointment was created and time, how old he is, along with the name of his insurance company. You can see the note section that's attached to the appointment. It says that he'd like a Wednesday appointment at 4 p.m. as soon as possible. He is concerned about his right eye. His last physical was two years ago and no other notable issues. So that's great information you get just by hovering over the patient's appointment. I want to point out that now that George has a patient file created, we no longer have that little person icon with the piece of paper behind it. We can have his appointment selected and go to our options menu and click view patient information. That is a quick way to get over to George's patient info screen and you could edit any information from here that you need to or just check in on some details as necessary. You do have an option as well to view his ledger, which you can also get to just by having the appointment selected and clicking on ledger at the top of the screen as well. And then we have some print options. Print patient report gives us an option to print out George's billing information or a couple different options for patient labels. If you have paper charts that you're keeping in the office and you want to go ahead and have a label for him to attach to his chart, we also have a specific print label option, which gives you those same details. We have print super bill form, which will give you two options of a super bill to choose. Print today's super bills will print all of today's super bills for every patient you have on your scheduler, not just the one patient selected. And then print appointment report will give you several options to print out. So you could scroll through this whole list and decide what's important to you. More than likely, print appointment report, you're probably looking for this appointment contact list or appointment list. But you do have a number of other options here that you could utilize. If I deselect George just by clicking anywhere in the blank space on the scheduler and right click on the scheduler, I also have a few additional options. To add an appointment to the schedule, you can see there's a hotkey of F8. That does correspond to our option over here to add an appointment as well. I can print the schedule out right from the schedule. It is going to print the day's schedule that I have pulled up on my scheduler. Separating today's repeats is pertaining to having a recurring appointment. So what that means is if we open up George's appointment and here we had asked George to come in once a week, every week at the same time so we could test his blood sugar weekly. 
If I click on the word none, it lets me create a weekly appointment the same date and then I could set it up for every one week for the next two months, for example. By creating a recurring or repeating appointment and looking at next Wednesday, we could see that it's got a little green squiggly on the appointment. That means that this appointment repeats itself multiple times. So if we just jump out a couple weeks to the 25th, for example, we can see George's on there as well. If we go to George's patient information screen and take a look here, we don't see all of the repeating appointments that George has. We only see today's appointment. So by right clicking on the scheduler and clicking separate today's repeats, it individualizes this one appointment on the scheduler for today so that you can modify this one without it asking you if you want to modify any of the other grouped appointments because it's no longer grouped with the other recurring appointments. Another option here on the scheduler is to set an email reminder for all appointments in this view. And again, the view is the day that you're looking at. You could look at a weekly view or a monthly view. And if I right click anywhere in here, I still have the option to send an email to all appointments in this view. The email would go out to everybody within this date range we have captured here, which you can change on the little calendar and decide what date range you want to capture. And everybody would get an email reminding them of their appointment in the future. Another option we have is to check the eligibility. This is the real-time insurance information or eligibility. You can do it for one appointment or for all appointments on the view. And that would give you a pop-up in the middle of the screen that gives you the insurance details for each patient if their insurance company participates with that and if you sign up for that option through your clearinghouse. And the last option we have is to create a new encounter for our patient and we'll be dealing with the encounters at a later video as that pertains to EHR. So moving forward, I'm going to go ahead and say that George was here. We made him ready to be seen for his appointment. So we have our green dot. Then once George is taken in back, we can change his appointment status to being seen. Once George is ready to come up front, the medical assistants in back can go ahead and change his status to checking out to alert the front office that he's headed up. And then the front office can go ahead and change his status to completed once he walks up and begin the checkout process with him. Keep in mind, all of these options are not necessary to use. It's just a way for you to track where your patient's at. So if you have a bigger office and that's helpful, go ahead and use those options. If you have a smaller office and marking George checked in and then marking him completed is good enough for you. You don't have to walk through all of these different options. Just choose the one you want to go to directly. I'm going to go ahead and mark George. Before we complete George's appointment, I'm going to go ahead and show you canceled and missed, and then we'll get into completing and going to the ledger. If I mark George's appointment as canceled, it literally deletes the appointment from the scheduler. It does not keep the appointment anywhere. However, it does track how many times George has canceled on us. We can find that information from the patient information screen by viewing George's dashboard, which is in the options menu. Once the dashboard pops open, you can see all members of the family attached to George's account. It's just him right now. You can see his alerts. You get a snapshot of his account from the family angle and as an individual. Also, we can see canceled appointments as one, missed appointments as zero. He is not scheduled for a next appointment. You also have a little section here to check out the patient's responsibility to get an idea of the patient's balance. So we could say for the selected patient only, either by statement date or patient responsibility options. We have this aging tab that we're looking at, how old is each balance. And then we also have a procedure analysis tab which would show you charges from a date range. This is really handy for analyzing somebody's account or seeing how many appointments they've missed at a glance. I'm going to go ahead back to the schedule, go to my appointment list, and I do want to point out that even though George's appointment is deleted, in the appointment list it still tracks that he has had a canceled appointment. 
If I try to go to that appointment, you can see the appointment's not found. So don't expect to pick up the appointment and reschedule it if you've canceled it. However, for the sake of learning, I'm going to go back to this appointment list. Keeping a record of the canceled appointment on the appointment list is handy because it lets you see perhaps an idea of who you need to get rescheduled. So I do have a status filter up here at the top of the screen on my appointments list. If I want to search by all canceled appointments, regardless of patient, I would have a cancellation list in essence here. I'm going to go ahead and remove the status. And what I'm going to do next is go ahead and grab this appointment for George and put it on today's schedule and take the recurrence off of the appointment and save it to today. I'm gonna to close the screen. Here we have a new appointment for George for us to work with. I wanna show you one more option as to how to manage this appointment and I left click on it to select it. Again, pay attention to where the blue halo is on your scheduler. I'm gonna right click for my options and go down to change status and mark the appointment missed. When you mark an appointment missed, it does keep the appointment unlike canceling the appointment. So the nice thing is I do get to put in a reason for the missed appointment. Perhaps he missed today because he was sick or maybe he had a flat tire. And so missed appointments are those people you may have been alerted to, but most likely not. They just didn't show up for their appointment. And so rather than canceling them and deleting the record, you're probably going to want to investigate a little bit further and find find out if they need to get rescheduled, if they're okay, and see how to manage that patient going forward. So once I put in a reason for the missed appointment, it does keep the appointment on the schedule as a reminder for you. And also keep in mind that that appointment is still on your appointment list. And I can search by status of missed appointments and find that missed appointment for George if he were to call in and say, I think I might have missed an appointment. I can go here and double check and say, yes, you did. It was on the 6th at 9.45. The great thing about this is that once you make contact with George and he's ready to reschedule that appointment, you can come to the appointment that he missed, which we know from the appointment list. We can right click and make a copy of this appointment, leave this appointment where it's at so you have a history of him missing that appointment or what happened during that time frame on your scheduler that day. Go to the next available day that you can get him rescheduled for, select a time, right click and paste the new appointment. It does make an exact copy of the original appointment, so we do still have the missed status on the appointment. So we would want to select the appointment, right-click, and change the status to unconfirmed or whatever other status is necessary at that time. So rather than recreating the appointment from scratch, it's a great way to just quickly grab a copy of the appointment and add it where you need it. Coming back to today, I want to go ahead and select George's appointment, right-click, and delete it and just let you know that deleting the appointment unlike missed and canceled it does not track that anywhere so if you delete an appointment you will not have a record of having it deleted unless someone with the proper security wants to run the audit trail to find out who was deleted so it's important to not delete patients if you're planning on rescheduling them or if you need to track that they did miss their appointment or canceled their appointment on short notice today. I'm going to go ahead and recreate an appointment for George Clooney and we're going to move on to completing the appointment. So now that he's an existing patient, what I'll do is double click where I'd like to schedule him, let's say today at 930, and start typing his chart number, which again is based on his last name, CLO. I could continue typing in the rest of his chart number, which is the first two letters of his first name. But as you can see, his name's already chosen here because the system filters the patients and takes you to the closest person to what you've typed in so far automatically. So I can just click his name. We get our alert pop up here, which we can review. He does come in a wheelchair. We need to know that he's allergic to latex. We click OK. We also get a pop up that states George has missed appointments. So you can see he did miss I, for reasons of a flat tire and also he was sick. Those would in theory be two separate appointments. We can go ahead and close this screen now that we've verified the history on that. And the other thing that's really neat about this appointment tracker is here we can also see a blurb about missed appointments. It shows two. We can click on the two and it brings back that missed appointment list. 
it does also show the last reason that was entered for why George missed. I'm going to go ahead and say George is still a new patient. We'll keep his appointment to 45 minutes, plug in a reason for his appointment, new patient exam, and just save our changes very quickly. Now that George has an appointment, we can right-click, change the status, and mark him complete. Once we select complete, it puts a green check mark on the appointment, and it also grays the appointment out. So you know that this patient is no longer in the office. From here, it's really easy to select the appointment and jump to the ledger and start to post George's charges from today. I want to point out in the options menu, you have a closed screen option. We can customize our view as well in this screen, which again are these little blue headers that we're looking at. And we could jump to George's dashboard and take a look at his information there. As George's history with us continues, we'll have more information available on this dashboard. You can see here from the dashboard as well his next visit that's laid out, just as an FYI. I'm going to review a few helpful pieces of information here on the ledger before we post charges. So we do have a little red cross here. If you click that, it does give you the medical alert pop-up. We have George's name here, which is a hyperlink. So if I click George's name, that does take me immediately to Patient George's information. We can confirm George's date of birth, the next appointment that he has scheduled, which again is a hyperlink. So by clicking that, it takes me to his appointment. I can quickly use my back button to go back to his ledger. The last patient payment and the last insurance payment history would be listed right here just for easy access. The billing information box is going to tell you what George's copay is, which you recall we also saw on his appointment. And then it also has all of his insurance plans that he is. It also has all of the insurance plans that are attached to George. Currently, we just have one primary insurance plan through Blue Cross Blue Shield. And then we also have the head of household listed here at the bottom. Remember, the head of household is indicating who's responsible for the bill on this account, not who the subscriber of the insurance is. Currently, there is no balance here to look at, so we're going to dismiss that section for the moment along with this middle box until we have a balance to deal with. The far right box is going to show you how much of the individual deductible has been used and what's remaining, and the family deductible as well. I want to go ahead and review now what a billing is. So you can see a billing number has been attached to George's ledger. Essentially, some of you may know a billing in other terms, such as a case. A billing is essentially a way we label whatever charges are going to show up here on George's ledger. Those charges all have the same data attached to them, meaning they all are going to be going to the same insurance company. They're all going to have the same main set of diagnosis codes attached to them. And a few other options that may or may not be the same is the date of service. Some offices choose to create a new billing or a new case for the patient every time the patient comes in the door, so per date of service. Other offices keep the same billing number and just continue to add transactions regardless of date of service to that billing until the insurance company changes. Whether that be going from one insurance company to another, going from having insurance to no longer having it, or not having insurance to having it. Anytime the billing information changes, you're going to want to create a new billing. The other times that you'll create a new billing is totally up to you. So if the default diagnosis codes change for the patient, that's a great reason to go ahead and create a new billing. If the details of the transactions themselves change, that's also a great time to create a new billing. So I'm going to show you all of the options, and it's up to you in the nature of your practice as to when you use the new billing option. So before I go ahead and add any charges to George, I'm going to go to my options menu. I don't need to create a new billing because we haven't done anything with this billing yet. I don't have a billing to copy yet, so I'm just going to go to View Billing Options. We know that George's billing number is billing number one, and we can verify we're looking at the correct details for the billing by just verifying the billing number here. Once again, George's name is a hyperlink. We could jump to his patient information screen. We do see his birth date here for verification. 
And if we click on his birthday, it also takes us to his patient information screen. Another time you might use a new billing is if the facility in which the services were rendered is different than the default facility you work out of. If you don't select a default facility, then you can have a couple different billings attached to different facilities if the patient may see you one week at your office and another week at the hospital and continues to visit you at both places. Just for example, we do have the date that the billing was opened. We can go ahead and fill in a description of the billing if that helps to keep your cases or reasons for the new billing separated. For example, I could label this a new patient for a new patient billing or perhaps initial visit and tests. The facility in which we worked out of to complete these services was the Total MD setup facility. If that is not the facility I'd like to use, I could click my drop down and choose an alternate facility. We don't have an alternate in the system, but if you needed to add one, you could do so on the fly by clicking on this magnifying glass, which takes us to our address list. Now we would click new address, make sure to label the type facility or it won't show up in the right menu for you. And then we're gonna go ahead and plug in the details of that facility here so it will populate on our claim form. If you plan on using this facility for billing purposes, please do make sure you plug in the NPI number for that facility. The facility ID is asking either for the tax ID or employer ID number or for the social security number. You have a space to put in a description if need be. And then once again, we could select a qualifier if for insurance purposes, they require a UPIN number or some other additional ID number to plug in there and save our changes. If I close out and work my way back to the billing that I had open, now you'll be able to see that I do have an additional facility to choose. I can attach an attorney here, which again is done by the same process, selecting your magnifying glass, choosing new address, and make sure you choose type attorney when you enter that in, if that should be relevant. And then I do have the default provider that provided the service. Same concept applies here if you needed to add additional providers that were not already set up in your system. I do have a pre-authorization number that I originally entered on George's patient information screen in our last video. Just below, we have default diagnoses. I want to point out that any details you plug into this billing information screen and claim information screen, all of these details will populate on any claim you create under billing number one, regardless of date of service. I went ahead and had the diagnosis codes added to the system, like you most likely have already. So here we have a space to choose our default diagnoses. If I click the drop down menu, it gives me the list to scroll through. If I do know the diagnosis code, I can go ahead and type it in. And if I don't know the diagnosis code, I have a couple ways I can search for it. So if I did need to search for a diagnosis, I'm gonna click the magnifying glass. And depending on whether or not I'm looking for ICD-9 or ICD-10, I can select my options up here at the top. So I'm choosing to find ICD-10. A really nice feature is we added in an ICD-9 link space. What that means is if I know the ICD-9 code, I can type it in and the system will show me the connecting ICD-10 code. So if this is the code I'd like to use for the patient, I'll go ahead and choose select code and it'll populate inside my patient's default diagnosis. I'm gonna go ahead and choose just a couple random diagnosis codes. Just to have a few more items here to work with when we get to the ledger. And I also wanna point out down here at the bottom of the screen, you have a space for referral information. If you had filled that data in on the patient information screen, it'll already be filled in here as far as who referred the patient to you. On the right hand side of the screen, you can see what insurance is currently attached to this billing number. So this is going to reflect who you're billing for the transactions that are gonna be under billing number one. You also do have an option to mark this as an institutional claim if that is the case. And you get a new tab up here called diagnosis. You also get an institutional claim tab and under billing information, some of your data changes. Going back to a standard claim, I'm gonna to click on the claim information tab you do have additional information you could plug in here which will populate on your claim form such as 
is date of injury, illness, or last menstrual period, similar symptoms date, unable to work dates, hospital dates, etc. If it's a workers' comp claim, you have workers' comp information here. And what providers are you planning on paying? If the provider you need to pay is the provider that's the default provider and the doctor already selected for the claim form, you do not have to reselect him here in this space. Only if it's a different provider will you need to mark that information. On the right hand side of the screen, you have initial treatment dates. We could go ahead and plug that in for today's date since this is the patient's first visit. First contact could also be today and any additional information you'd like to plug in. Down here at the bottom, we have the place of service code. If the patient was seen at the office, we're going to go ahead and enter our code 11. You will need to change this if the patient is seen elsewhere out of the office, and that should correspond with your facility information here. So just keep that in mind. So another reason you might create a new billing is if there's a different facility where the treatment was rendered. Because remember, all of the transactions going on billing number one will have these same details the same facility, same default provider, same default diagnoses, and the same claim information that we have here. I'm going to go ahead and save our changes, and now we're ready to enter a new transaction. If I go to my options menu and just review down the list, I have a transaction menu in which I could click new transaction, use a multi-code, or post from treatment plan. If you did create a treatment plan for your patient already, you can go ahead and post charges from here. If not, I may recommend using a multi-code for a new patient visit, for example. If you remember in a previous video, we did create a multi-code that said office visit with blood and urinalysis testing. If I click on that multi-code, it's going to automatically add the procedure code to this patient that we need to add. If I click on this item, it's going to automatically add the transaction for our patient that is tied into that multi-code. The other way we can add a transaction is by clicking New Transaction. Once I click New Transaction, it gives us the date and I'm free to go ahead and select a CPT code or a service code that we performed on the patient. Let's go ahead to our office visit codes and we'll choose an office visit for a new patient. I can tab through these options or I can use my enter button on my keyboard and it will take us through the additional spaces. Here we have a position for four different modifiers. So if there is a modifier, you can go ahead and punch that in. If not, just leave them blank and tab through them. If you had already entered your fee schedules, then the amount that you're needing to post for this code would automatically populate. Since we did not, I'm going to go ahead and just type in $50. We can say how many units of this item we performed. And I know this is an office visit, but for example, if I change it to two, it does change the amount that we are billing for on our claim. I'll go ahead and change that back to one. You can see we have our diagnosis codes that are listed here, diagnosis one, two, and three. And those are coming from the billing options section where we entered those default diagnosis codes just a moment ago. The DX one, two, three, and four positions are there to choose which diagnoses apply to this transaction because keep in mind these three diagnoses since they are the default on this billing number they're going to show up on every transaction we add to this patient's ledger. This is a way for you to say that diagnosis code 2 and 3 do not apply to this particular transaction and your claim form will only reflect that diagnosis 1 applies to this transaction. Next we have the provider code which will automatically populate for us because we did choose a default provider. If this this is not the correct provider, you can change it here and choose another provider and you'll also want to change that under your billing options screen as well. When a payment is received, we do have a place to put in the check number if it was paid via check and the insurance one insurance 2 and insurance 3 payment section, a quick visual cue to indicate whether or not this claim has closed for primary, secondary, or tertiary insurance. Because the patient does not have secondary or tertiary insurance, these boxes are already marked off as being closed. We do have options here to put in a start time and end time to calculate how much time was spent on a procedure if that is relevant. Also, we have a space for a measurement unit, NDC number, and then here we have additional diagnosis code spaces. If we don't need 
all of the additional diagnoses. I'm going to go ahead and show you how to remove those and also start and end time and anything else that's irrelevant to the scope of your practice. Proceeding forward, we have time units, and at the end of the screen, I do have ICD-10 checked off here. That's indicating that this ledger and this procedure is marked to be ICD-10 capable. Once you tab through the end of the line, it does save this line item. And then you could go ahead and click New Transaction and add another new item. I want to point out that we do get a pop-up that says this patient has two more authorized visits, only for George. And that's coming from the insurance section where we put in pre-authorization information. So it's really handy to have that information pop up for you. As I'm entering in another procedure code, you'll notice over here off to the side, we do have a Save Transaction button until I tab through the line or until I just click save transaction. The transaction goes in similarly to the initial transaction with the same provider and the same default diagnoses checked off as being applicable. If this new transaction code happens to have diagnosis 2 and 3 applied to it, we can go ahead and check the boxes here and then save our transaction with that new information. Since we have a number of items in this scenario that is irrelevant in our view here, I'm going to go ahead and show you how to remove that. And that is, of course, in our options menu, Customize View. You can also right-click on your screen to get some additional options as well. On the right-hand side, I have the fields that I'm currently viewing. And I'm going to scroll down until I get to start and end time. And I'm going to remove those from my screen because they're not going to apply to anything that we're learning today. So I'm simply going to select the items that we do not need on our screen. If you hold the control button down and click on the items, you can select multiple items at once and then use your arrow over button all at once. Click your OK button, and now if we scroll to the right, you see our screen is a lot shorter than it previously was. Keep in mind that all of these items can be moved around, so perhaps I want my check number over here by the amount that we're charging. I can just drop that item in there. If I'd like to shorten the screen a little bit, I can squeeze in the check number and also the units and any additional item that appears to be a little long in length for what we're needing. And in doing so, we have effectively fit everything onto one screen without having to scroll across the bottom. Now that I've got two transactions here, I want to point out some additional options for editing these items. If I double click on the second code, the 00100, it's going to open up the charge detail for that code. This is just additional information that we're tying into that code, such as any modifiers, once again, units of measurement, and how those are measured. And then we have an option to plug in the fee that we're charging here as well. I do see the default diagnosis codes that are attached to this item. I can also go ahead and mark that this item is uninsurable by clicking Do Not Bill Insurance and perhaps do not bill patient if we're not charging the patient for that item. So any one particular code that you do not want to bill to one particular patient, you can open up the charge detail for that item and mark it as uninsurable. You can also mark the code as un uninsurable for every patient you have if you'd like to do that from the list and service code list. I'm going to go ahead and remove the do not bill insurance so we can create a claim for that. And I also want to point out further down here, we have a space for NDC number if it's an emergency visit and some additional options as well. We'll go ahead and save our changes and we get a pop up that says, would you like to mark the appointment for this date as complete? I'm going to go ahead and say no because we're not quite done yet. If I say yes, it does take away one authorized visit from our visit count for this patient. Now we have fees for both items. I want to point out up here at the top that we have a section to show us that we are going to bill Blue Cross for the $150 balance. And currently, George Clooney owes a balance of $0 outside of his $25 copay. Here we have the actual or true numbers box where it shows the amount of charges you billed, any adjustments, any payments, and a grand total for this account. And then off to the side, we do have a snapshot of the insurance information. 
At this point, I'd like to go ahead and collect the patient's copay. So in order to do so, I'm going to go to my options menu and just go down the list until we find enter a payment and click new patient payment slash adjustment. When I get into the patient payment entry screen, I want to point out the patient's name, today's date, I do have a space for check number if the patient does pay via check, and deposit description says patient copay. If the patient were not paying a copay but just some other balance that they owed, you can click this drop down menu and choose a different option such as cash payment, credit card, check, or visa. We're going to go ahead and leave it as copay. And then on the right hand side, if you do choose copay, the deposit method is to indicate whether or not they paid you with check, cash, credit card, or electronic funds transfer. We'll go ahead and use the example of check, plug in a check number, and punch in how much money they paid for their copay. If I look here off to the right, I can see that their copay is $25, so there's an easy way of remembering how much they should be paying. We do have an adjustment code just above the payment section, but I want to point out, unless I'm applying an adjustment here, the adjustment code is irrelevant sitting in this screen at the moment. I'm going to go ahead and save our changes. And now at the top of the screen, you have an unapplied payment of $25, which is the patient's copay. It shows as unapplied because it hasn't been attached to any specific transaction as of yet. Each office chooses to handle this differently. Some offices do apply that $25 to a specific procedure code after they receive the EOB. Other offices will create a procedure code that says copay simply in order to apply the $25 payment to a $25 copay charge, which is certainly acceptable. At this point, I'm going to go ahead and create a new procedure code that does reflect copay. So to do so, I'm going to go to the list menu, service code list, and another great feature about this system is if you did currently start adding something to the screen that you did not save, it does give you a warning that you did not save your data. You can choose to save the information at this point or discard the information. Now that I'm on my service code list, I'll go to the options menu and click new service code. And I'm going to create the code that says patient copay. The description I put in is going to say patient charge for copay. And the type of code I'm creating is a fee for service code. I'm going to go ahead and plug that code into the other procedures. I'm going to go ahead and plug that code into the office visit category, leave off any modifiers, global periods, etc. And I am going to mark this a do not bill insurance code. I could go ahead and put in fee amounts on the fee schedule for that item. However, each patient may have a different copay, so I'm going to leave it blank so that I can populate it as we come across it and simply save our changes. Walking my way back to the patient's ledger, I'll click New Transaction, and I'm going to start to type in the code we created, PTCO, and you can see Patient Charge for Copay. I'll select that. And since the patient's copayment is $25, I'm going to create a charge of $25 for that item and save the transaction. Now I'm going to go ahead to the options menu once again and create our claim to send to insurance. So once I click create claim, it does show only two transactions are eligible to be billed. The reason being is that when I created this code, I just said that this is an uninsurable item. Yes, we want to continue and it tells us one claim was created and if we would like to view it, you can say yes or no. Regardless at this point, that claim is going to go to the batch which is found under the claim screen. We'll go ahead and say yes in this instance. So taking a look at our CMS 1500 form, you can see that this is going out to Blue Cross and also we've got the patient's name, date of birth, all of the pertinent information on here. And if we scroll down, you can see just the two charges are listed there. We didn't have any modifiers, so there's nothing populating this field. And then we do have a diagnosis pointer. A refers to the primary diagnosis code that we put in. So the first charge only has one diagnosis attached to it, and that's diagnosis A. Here we have A, B, and C, which means the secondary code or transaction we added to this claim has all three diagnoses that apply to it. You can see the amount we're charging here, the rendering and PI number, and all of the appropriate data listed at the bottom of your claim form.
The billing tab of the screen will tell you the claim number, the billing number attached to the claim, and when it was created and for what patient. You can also see who the subscriber of the plan is. It happens to be also our patient which insurance company it's going to, and the timely filing information. So we need to get this claim filed by January 5th of 2016. We can also see an initial billing date and the last billing date if you're going to resubmit this claim for any reason down the road. And we have the claim status. If you are sending claims electronically, it's really important to note that the claim has to say ready to bill in order for that claim to go electronically to your clearinghouse. If it does not say ready to bill, it could have any number of other statuses such as failed claim validation. And if it's failed, you don't want to send that off to your clearinghouse because it has been checked and failed for a reason. The reason for failure could be any component that is required on the claim form, such as the patient's date of birth, the fee on the service code, if you were missing diagnosis codes, etc. So the great thing about this is, is that the box off to the right tells us the claim validation information and as you can see it did pass claim validation in this case. If it did fail it would actually spell out for you what items are missing on your claim form so you know what to fix. In the options menu I do want to point out we have an update claim option so if there was a failure on the claim you can go to either the patient's information screen or the insurance or jump to the patient's ledger and fix whatever items you are missing. Come back to the claim and simply update it to capture the new data that you've added. I'm going to close the screen. I'm going to go ahead and apply this unapplied payment to the patient's copay charge. To apply anything in this pink box that shows up, you simply click on the blue underlined numbers. It opens up a payment entry screen and we're going to hit the distribute button to send that $25 to a specific charge. Once I hit distribute, I can see here the payment amount and the original payment data that I plugged in. And now my job is to decide where to assign the $25 payment to. I have my patient's name here, the billing number, the date of service, and the charges that I billed out, the codes that I billed out, the amount I charged per each item, and the remaining balance for each item. Under today's payment, it's waiting for me to plug in a dollar amount next to each of these items. The $25 should be applied to this $25 charge because we know this was charged out for the patient's copay and the money we collected is for the patient's copay. So this is what we call line by line accounting. I'm going to take a specific payment and apply it to a very specific charge. It auto calculates what the balance will be for that item once you apply money to it. However, the money is not applied to the item until you actually click your save changes button here in your options menu. If I were making any adjustments for any reason, I can also do so in this moment as well by making sure I choose an appropriate adjustment code, which keep in mind you can create as many adjustment codes as you need. If I'd like to give a 5% courtesy off of this $100 charge, I'm simply going to click inside this box and type in $5, and you can see it automatically calculates the remaining portion for that item and save my changes. After I hit save, it walks me backwards through my screens and you can see we no longer have an unapplied amount. And down here at the bottom, we have the details of where that payment went to. So we had the patient copay code, we're paying $25 towards that. And then we had the 00100 CPT code, remaining balance is 95 and we're adjusting $5 off of that item. And now I'm gonna close the screen, get back to the patient's ledger and we can see each procedure and the amount that was applied to it. So here's our 00100. The adjustment is listed right below the charge it was attached to and $100 minus a $5 adjustment equals a $95 remaining balance. Then we have our patient copay charge, our copay payment, and $25 applied to that item equals a $0 balance on that item. Up here at the top, you can now see the total amount in charges, adjustments, and payments that have been received thus far. So here is the account's true balance regardless of who owes this remaining portion. 
I'm going to go ahead to the options menu and print out a statement to give the patient for their payment today and show them the adjustment as well before they head out the door. I have a few different options under print walkout. Keep in mind a walkout statement is something that the patient is walking out the door with. What that means is only charges and payments and adjustments from today will show up on that walkout statement. Think of the walkout as a receipt for your patient for today. So when I click print walkout, we have the option to choose which report we want to give the patient as a walkout. And I've got walkout receipt and walkout statement. Let's go ahead and take a look at the receipt first. Keep in mind our system does default to print preview all of our reports so you can see what those look like before wasting the paper if that's not what you were going for. The walkout receipt is designed to be a receipt that you give the patient just for their copay typically. So looking at this receipt, we have the name and address of the practice in the top corner, the patient's information, and it just shows very simply that the patient paid their copay of $25. So if they hand you money, this is just proof of their payment. Down at the bottom of this receipt, it does show future appointments for the patient as well, which is really handy. So if they pay their copay at the beginning of their visit, this is something that you can give them very easily for their records that you don't have to have their charges and everything else posted for. We do have a printer button up here in the top left corner since we're looking at the print preview. So when you're ready, you would just hit that printer button, choose which printer you want to send it to and hit OK. We're going to go back to print walkout. We're going to go ahead and choose print walkout and choose our other type of walkout, which is walkout statement and click the print button. And this one looks a little bit different in the center of the screen in the center of this report. So instead of just seeing the amount that they paid you, you actually see the details of the appointment as they were posted. So we have one charge for $50, our second charge for 100. You can see the adjustment that was attached to that $100 charge. Then you see our patient charge for copay charge that we added of 25 and then you see the patient's copay of 25 that was applied to the $25 charge. So we've got very simply what we billed, what was paid or adjusted off to the side. We also have the future appointment section down here at the bottom and then a total of payments and adjustments, total of charges and then the leftover balance as it currently stands. So this walkout statement is more of a detailed view of the patient's visit for the day, whereas the walkout receipt is just a receipt for their payment. And once again, that printer icon is always in the top left corner of your print preview screen. I'm going to go ahead and backtrack for a moment to our scheduler. And I want to point out if I open the patient's appointment by double clicking on it, in the options menu, we do have an enter a payment option right here as well. So if the patient checks in and you take their copay at that moment, whoever is collecting that money doesn't have to wait until the end of the process to complete their appointment in order to collect the money. They can simply open up the appointment, click enter payment, and put in the patient's copay right here without having to go to the ledger and go through the additional steps. And also, once they're done posting that payment, you do have a print receipt option right here as well, which will allow you to print the walkout receipt or the walkout statement at that moment. That's going to conclude this video. Join us next time for more in-depth information on the ledger, claims, and reports. Thank you so much.